Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, those watching on Facebook Live as well. Just want to make sure we were live there. Um, and welcome to today's presentation, Motor Cities at Home number 14. So we've been rolling along with this for quite a while, but we are ready to present the making of Making Tracks. So we're going behind the scenes on the uh, launch of exciting new material on our makingtracks.org website. And you're going to meet the people uh, behind the site and some of the content, and hopefully uh, you can answer some of your probing questions as we go along. But uh, first, I'm going to go through some materials on the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. First of all, I am uh, Brian Yap. I'm the Director of Programs and Operations for Motor Cities. Uh, and we're excited to have you here today to learn more about making tracks. Uh, first, we want to thank our uh, sponsors who help us with all of our programming uh, throughout the year, uh, DTE, UAW, and Don Nicholson Enterprises. So thank you all for your uh, generous support in making this all happen. Uh, for those who may not know, Motor Cities National Heritage Area is a nonprofit affiliate of the National Park Service. So we are a place designated for our automotive and labor history and our contributions to America's story. Uh, we are currently one of 55 national heritage areas around the country, each telling a different story about what made that region so important. Uh, or as again, uh, automotive and labor history uh, of Southeast and Central Michigan. Um, our mission is uh, to preserve, interpret, and promote the region's rich automotive and labor heritage uh, and its related economic impact, uh, while also enabling, supporting, and respecting its diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are ultimately uh, a product of our, of our project. So for those who are familiar with Motor Cities, you know this, but for those who may be joining us for the first time, uh, we are a very small nonprofit operation, but we service 10,000 square miles of Southeast Michigan because of the partners out across the region uh, that help to uh, share these stories. So we are stewards of preserving that history. Uh, we are the combined and amplified voices of our region. So our, our, our goal is to work together with all who help to uh, tell the story of automotive and labor heritage. And we are a community in our projects. And I'll just give you a few examples uh, of those. Uh, first of all, I mentioned the, uh, the, the footprint. We are a stewardship community. So we're in an area designated uh, of Southeast Michigan, as you see the map here that goes as far north as Saginaw, as far west as Kalamazoo, south to Monroe, uh, and east into Macomb County. So all points in between are the motor cities that make uh, up this heritage area and have been designated for their significance. There you see a list of them there. Uh, we are our story of the week, which uh, each week we put out a historic uh, story about automotive or labor history. And so you should be looking forward uh, today, actually, because it comes out each Wednesday. So if you're not on the mailing list, uh, please look forward to joining it. Uh, we are our, our uh, events and attractions. So each year, the Heritage Area draws about 6 million visitors across the region to major automotive events and uh, museum attractions and generates a tremendous economic impact. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, approaching $500 million, $480 million worth of economic impact across the region for these automotive events and our attractions. Uh, because we're a part of the National Park Service, we are uh, very proud to be part of the Passport Stamp Program. So for those familiar with that uh, program around the country, we are able to utilize that uh, stamp program here uh, in the heritage area. So many of our partner sites will have you uh, able to receive a stamp uh, as you go through, uh, just like you would if you went to the Washington Monument or Lincoln Memorial, you can get it right here in the heritage area. Our Wayside Exhibit Program also uh, is spread across that 10,000 square miles with uh, signage, interpretive signs that tell the story of the people and the places and the ideas uh, that made the region so great that put the world on wheels. Uh, so whether it's Ypsilanti or Flint, or Dearborn or Detroit, uh, Saginaw or Romeo, uh, any, many cities around the region had their own contribution. So we put the signs in to sort of help them tell uh, their stories. You know, on the, on the side of taking concepts to reality, which I think we kind of make dreams come true sometimes as far as projects go, uh, this is a concept of the Fort Street Bridge Park. So this is um, a story we've been telling for several years. It is the site of the 1932 Fort Hunger March. So this year we're actually recognizing 90 years of that march. Uh, and the idea was to build a park to commemorate that uh, at the confluence between Detroit and Dearborn at the bridge where they marched over. Uh, from concept to reality, the park is now in place uh, thanks to a consortium of community partners. It's there to service the community. It's uh, right in the center of it is a beautiful jewel um, uh, monument, uh, which is made of parts from the original bridge. Uh, and the, and the, both the spirit of the park and the actual uh, memorial monument there titled March On. So the idea is that you continue with the spirit of the energy of those who marched and um, stood up for things almost 100 years ago and still uh, stand for that today. So we're excited to have been a part of the Fort Street Bridge Park when we talk about concepts of reality. Another concept to reality is our Motor Cities Highway signs, which help to tell people 
uh, about the fact that they are entering a place of uh, such historic significance. So as they enter the heritage area, whether it's from the north or the south or east or west, they're running into a sign that lets them know they're coming to a very special place. Uh, this was a concept, but after almost 20 years of hard work, we have now uh, signs that uh, adorn our entryways into the region, let people know they're in a very special place and let them know that that place is connected to the National Park Service. So uh, as the Park Service or Stewards of America's story, uh, you are in a, a safe place when you travel through the heritage area as far as telling America's history. So so proud of, of these sorts of uh, things that represent the story of, of the heritage area. And, and before we get into, again, our, our presentation for today, just want to thank our, our sponsor as I transition from our slides, thank our sponsor, uh, DTE, UAW, and uh, Don Nicholson Enterprises. As I uh, let me set my screen here. And we're going to start sharing some stuff about making tracks. So, so as I reset my screen, I'm going to take us to uh, today's talk, which is all about new content on the makingtracks.org. So before we get to today, let me tell you a little story about how Making Tracks came to be. So the idea behind Making Tracks was actually supported by uh, the Ford Motor Company in a partnership with the Charles H. Wright Museum uh, a little over 10 years ago. And so the idea was that we wanted to create a, a virtual platform, a website that told the story of African-Americans experience in the auto industry. So not necessarily, you know, we can't tell them all, but the idea is that you would capture concepts of great accomplishments of trials and tribulations of ups and downs of African-American and their experience in the auto industry for more than a century. So we started in the late 1800s with original content on making tracks and talked about the you know, creation of the automobile and talked about implementations and innovations like the moving assembly line and talked about um, you know uh, social uh, impacts like the great migration north of people that come and work in the auto factories. You know, talked about the evolution as as um, you know institutions like the UAW came online in the in the 30s and you know as we went on through organizing. So we we kind of covered uh, the African American experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, from the late 1800s through about the end of World War II. I mean, that was sort of a point where we we stopped and, and gather ourselves and um, you know that that remained there as a great tool for uh, teachers and, and those who wanted to use it uh, for years and and we just in 2020 uh, retooled the site so it looks completely different and it's now fully integrated into our motor cities uh, national heritage area site and with that came the motivation to say let's bring our story forward so it was time to start talking about making tracks too which now i think we just consider it making tracks as a continuum so we talk about making tracks too and talk about now how to tell the story, uh, you know, a more modern story as we bring things past the second half of the uh, century into the, the 50s and the 60s, 70s and beyond. Uh, and so Making Tracks now has new content on it today. We're talking about some of that content. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here and walk you through a little bit of what you'll see. Uh, and if you hold on tight, we're gonna meet our, our panelists as well. Um, and we're gonna talk about um, some of the process in creating Making Tracks. So, what you're seeing is what you see if you go to makingtracks.org. It is, again, fully integrated into the Motor Cities National Heritage Area website. So you can also find it up top uh, using our navigation bar. And we divide the site up into uh, three sections. So it is individual profiles, timeline, and additional resources. And I'm going to step you through uh, each one of those, kind of give you an idea of what you're going to see as you go through it. So the individual profiles are just what you would, would think they would be. They are profiles of, of individuals, of African-Americans who have made contributions to the auto industry. Uh, down through the years. And you'll see there at the very top of the page are our most recent interviews. These are new contributions, new interviews and stories that have been recently recorded uh, and, and posted through the site. These are individuals that, you know, that can kind of reflect the modern story of what is current in the industry of some very recently retired, but some, you know, in their third or fourth decade in, in automotive and have very interesting stories to talk about how they got here um, and how they stayed there. Below that, you will see some of the legacy content of Making Tracks. So these are uh, profiles that were posted in that first iteration of it that kind of went more with themes because we could not do you know, interviews of people who were working in the industry in the early 1900s. But we could capture the spirit of it by profiling individuals who would have been influential. For instance, a lot of times people do not realize that renowned uh, inventor and scientist uh, George Washington Carver had a very close relationship with Henry Ford, an inspiration of a, a teacher mentor uh, comrade sort of relationship and so many things were learned and passed back and forth between the two and so Ford credits Washington Carver for a lot of inspiration and um, work that he did uh, in preserving uh, you know sort of the scientific uh, ethos of uh, the, the uh, Ford Motor Company and you'll see profiles on individuals like Ed Davis who was the first uh, African-American to own uh, a major automotive uh, dealership so this was substantial in the 1930s you could imagine 
uh, an African American actually own a dealership and not be working out of the back door. And he still faced trials and tribulations, but still a landmark uh, there. Even C.R. Patterson, which is also our featured story of the week this week, with C.R. Patterson and Sons, who were the first um, to successfully sort of produce, manufacture their automobiles. They're out of Ohio, so they're not in the heritage area, but we will adopt them and extend to them because they've got a story to tell as well, uh, an amazing story. We do profiles on an individual like uh, Reverend Charles Hill, who sort of represents what would have been prevalent in the early stages of the auto industry and the relationship between African-Americans in the industry, and that he was a reverend who was uh, sort of a, a between uh, UAW and organizing. So when African-Americans would say, well, who can I trust uh, to, to lead the way in this new concept of organizing under automobile um, uh, labor, they turn to civil leaders, civic leaders like uh, Dr. Hill. So he's a profile of, of individuals who would have been prevalent in that. Uh, and William Perry was the first uh, salaried African-American employee for a motor company. So interesting story. There's an entire uh, wonderful video about women, uh, African-American women in the automobile industry. And I'll, I'll just kind of give away the lead on that is that every Rosie the River there didn't look like, you know, the picture did. And that we need to give honor and credit for the role of African-American women uh, throughout the early part of the industry that transitioned north as well as um, when they had to actually enter the workforce uh, during World War II. And then there's an entire, uh, what I call sort of a mini documentary that combines all of this history and a chronology and talks about the African-American experience as a whole from the 19, from the 1890s all the way up through about 1947. So I encourage you all, if you haven't, to take a look at all of these videos, legacy videos, as well as the new content. You'll be amazed at some of the stories that are shared by uh, these new contemporary leaders in automotive. So that, those are our individual profiles. We're also excited to have our timeline updated. So once again, the timeline was kind of divided into buckets and eras of, of time and entry, but you can see as we click through some of the sort of content you will find there. There will, there will be entries on things that were uh, incredibly important to automotive history. You know, I mentioned 1932 Ford Hunger March, and you see an entry here on that. But there would be also entries about, you know, what was going on in Black America. So something like Detroit's uh, Second Baptist Church, or uh, there will be information about, uh, for instance, this is a relatively new entry, you know, I'll point this out today. The, uh, the Negro Motorist Green Book, a uh, very um, popular and, and um, well-awarded movie that came out a couple of years ago that maybe exposed some people for the first time to this, but this concept of a book that was actually a guide to how to travel for the Negro driver and existed for such a long period of time it needs to be uh, documented here because it's the auto industry that allowed that drive around to happen. So give you an idea of what happened here. And of course, major world events like World War II would be profiled here uh, on our timeline as well. So as you go through the timeline, you'll run into new entries as we've added new content. As you look in the 1950s and 60s, you'll start to see more uh, materials as we move things forward. You know, impact of the Korean War or the Brown versus Board of Education, as you can imagine, the integration in schools led to so many other things um, as far as automobiles. So great new stories have been added here. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to, again, take a look at the timeline entries. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, on those. So just a quick tour around making tracks um, as, you, as you take it all in. And I encourage you to explore on your own time. The last thing is uh, additional resources, which kind of breaks down uh, how things can be utilized. Uh, we, we created actual uh, short classroom lessons for the materials that existed on the legacy site. So if you were looking at the 1930s and you wanted to learn more about the Ford Hunger March, uh, your teacher, you're, you're a student, you're an interested parent, uh, you, you know, that you want to go in, that you would have a little mini lesson that talks about the story of the march uh, and leads you some additional resources there. So once again, um, a tool that we uh, continue to update as we move forward. With all of that groundwork being uh, laid, I'm going to stop sharing so everyone can see the full full glory of our, our panel now and introduce uh, our panel to you. We're going to have some, some discussion here. Uh, so first, this is the team that sort of did the primary work on making tracks. The inspiration was there, but we had to put the, the inspiration into action. So uh, on your screen, I'm going to first start with uh, Dr. Carolyn Carter, who is, uh, full disclosure, a member of the Motor City's National Heritage Area Board. But that's okay, because I think it, even if she weren't a member of the board, she would be very much interested in um, the work that we're doing here. She has a very long history uh, in uh, the African American diaspora and uh, collecting oral histories and, and really documenting our stories. So we welcome Dr. Carter. We'll hear from her uh, in just a moment. Uh, we have Dr. Louise and Lee Filion, who is uh, joining us as a fellow from the University of Michigan's uh, you know, interesting story that we'll get to with Louise Celine in a moment of how we came to be connected with each other. But it's been a pleasure working with her over the last uh, 
year or so on some of this content, uh, along with some other materials uh, that we're working on with uh, Motor City's um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. So really exciting times. And Rebecca Phoenix joins us. Uh, she's a recent uh, graduate of Wayne State University and an enthusiast, if you will, on, on Detroit's history as well as uh, the region's history. And uh, again, it's been a pleasure working with her uh, along the way as she's added so much to this story, done a lot of our photo research and a lot of odds and ends, a lot of extra uh, little notes and, and things. I would look up and get an email from Rebecca on an odd day and say, you know, Brian, had you ever seen this? And I go, well, my eyes are open, which is which is amazing to have. So uh, a, a great team that's joined us, and uh, we're going to talk to each one of them. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Carter. So uh, Dr. Carter, as I mentioned, you're a you know, full disclosure member of the Motor City's Board of Directors, but having gotten to know you the last you know, couple of years, I, I think this is the sort of project that you probably would have been involved in one way or the other, even if you weren't a member of the board. I think if you had heard that we were collecting stories of uh, the rich automotive history and African-Americans role in it, that you would have stood up from your couch, put on your coat, and been on the way to wherever it was going to be happening. So we thank you for your contribution. And, and I wanted you to talk about sort of that, that uh, process, that, that importance of collecting these stories, especially in this back half of the century, collecting the authentic stories of African Americans as they've been, you know, their role in the automotive industry. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for attending, and thank you, Brian. And as I answer that question, I think back and reflect on my own history. Um, and the passion that I have for that. And we got it from our ancestors. Our family members passed on stories, they told stories. Um, and if you were a child and you listened, sometimes you didn't, you didn't wanna hear it. And now as you get older, it becomes important. And I think as we look at our history, our American history, not just our African-American history, but our total American history and how those stories, they overlapped each other um, because we were a melting pot of, of people. My ancestors came here from the South, from Tennessee during the automotive boom, and they worked in the automotive industry. My great grandfather worked at Rouge Park. My grandfather worked for Revere Copper and Brass. And so those stories that we heard and those people in our life are very important. And the people who are listening and watching today, I would encourage you to collect those stories, to ask those stories, to interview your people, no matter how minute you think the their involvement was. It's a story. It's because it is a part of a collection of stories. And we all have a story to tell. And I think all history has been passed down through all of our families in some form or fashion. And it's important that we record that information because specifically during this pandemic, and we're losing so many people. And when you've gone, in the words of Alex Haley, when a person goes to be with the ancestors, it's like burning a library and all of those stories go with them. And so I think that's just the importance. It's my passion. And I, I love listening to stories and listening to the people who, um, who were there um, because it makes it so real for us today. Yeah. You know, one of the things about uh, about Motor Cities, as a national heritage area, as I explained, sort of our format is that we are one of 55 around the country, but we tell the story of a living industry, one that is continuing to evolve and grow and change and history is being made every day. And so one of the things that's really exciting for me to come to work every day is that there's always a new story unfolding. There's, there's some new development and there are new people that come into that fold. So this process of meeting new people and hearing their stories, you know, has really been uh, encouraging. I, I will certainly share that uh, like you said, Dr. Carter, my story is very much making tracks as well. I mean, my, both of my grandfathers came from Georgia, you know, in the, around the time of World War II and, and moved to uh, Detroit, one via Chicago, one via New York, and moved to Detroit, one for Ford, one for Chrysler, and worked for 30 years, providing for their family and through ups and downs and created sort of what we consider the, the middle class. I mean, how do you have eight kids on one income <laughs> and everybody's living comfortably? Besides, I give thanks to Chrysler, uh, the Chrysler Corporation for providing years of, of work, but I thank my grandfather for providing years of service. Uh, my other grandfather was um, a tool and die man for Ford Motor Company in a time where they were not trying to train uh, African-Americans in skilled trades, and he had to fight very hard. And so I honor him in, in the memory of his work and also the UAW for standing up for him when the time was there to, to say he needs to progress forward and allow him to gain skilled trade, trades and again, to grow. And I was also talking about this topic, you know, a little more family history, talking about this topic with one of my cousins-in-law, my wife's cousin, and she was talking about her grandfather. And what you just said, Dr. Carter, is when they're gone, and you don't realize the legacy that's been left behind. 
that she she didn't realize that her grandfather was who was a great uh, renowned negotiator for UAW worked along with Walter Ruther mm -hmm. and was called into the National Labor Relations Board by uh, President Kennedy. I mean, that level of leadership, his name is written in the, in the archives there at the, at the Ruther Library, mm -hmm. so, but she, she was just Papa. He was just that out to her, you know, and didn't realize until he was gone that this gentleman was somebody of, of such importance. So I think that message mm -hmm. from you, Dr. Carter, is that all those who are listening and those who will hear this is think about the stories that are probably tucked away mm -hmm right now, you know, that you've listened to your elders share with you and, and they're all critically important. People love to collect these histories. We have some very mm -hmm. uh, well-known repositories around our region at Michigan State, at Wayne State, at University of Michigan, who are there to professionally collect. Our museums like the Detroit Historical Museum mm -hmm. and the Automotive Hall of Fame, who are there to collect, and Motor City's National Heritage Area, who will be there to collect. I don't want to give away the future, but I think you're going to play <laughs> a, a big role in trying to make yeah. sure that stories are collected in a very, very, um, convenient manner so that you can share. We, we live in a world of technology that may, maybe a click of a button will allow you to record your, yes. your story for us uh, very soon. And that'll help this, this tapestry. So even though we posted uh, some great interviews with individuals, I think your stories, those who are listening, are just as critically important as theirs. Because there's there's a Papa and a Dada out there with stories mm -hmm. to be shared as well. So And all cultures. We're not just talking about African-Americans. I mean, we're a melting pot of all cultures in, in the Detroit area. And everyone came to Detroit because they wanted to work in the automotive industry. Yeah. So we, um, even though we love and appreciate our African-American stories, of course, but we want to encourage everyone, all cultures to participate because we were a melting pot of people in the Detroit area, especially in Black Bottom in the South, uh, coming South to North and coming East to West. Um, so we want to encourage everyone to participate in this process. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Carter. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm gonna uh, now uh, turn to Dr. Luis Celini Feleon, who is uh, joining us. So, Luis, I wanted you to first share how we came to be connected with each other because I think Motor City's work in this area of, of culturally uh, of telling cultural stories in the auto industry probably lit the fire to connect you to us. So maybe you can tell the story way, way back in in, 19, in 2020 when we connected with each other. Sure. So. Um... I was based, I still am, I was based at the University of Michigan and had a project on um, actually something a bit different, but not unrelated. That's what I will uh, explain. Mm -hmm. um, as um, worked on representations of the Volkswagen Beetle, I was very interested in, on Volkswagen Beetle in German and in American literature and culture since 1949, but also was very interested in kind of intercultural issues. Uh, let me explain maybe a little bit. Um, so I started, uh, you know, the more I started looking at uh, representations of major representations of the Beatle in American culture, uh, some of you in the audience will recall the famous ads from the uh, Doyle Dane Birdback Agency, probably, and one very, very famous ad said, um, don't buy an important car, buy a Volkswagen, right? And the more I started reading, digging into the, the literature as well, right, the fictional texts, I noticed how uh, the Beetle, the Volkswagen Beetle was um, consistently kind of appropriated and seen as this American icon. And I began to reflect on this and thinking how, you know, such an, um, an iconic car and other iconic objects also that are sometimes perceived as associated with one national culture become appropriated by another culture and seen as, um, as its own, right? As a kind of a local icon. And I started reflecting on this and this, you know, kind of tra transnational life of, of icons. So I guess I, what I was really interested in with Motor Cities was also to, you know, to work on a project like Making Trash, which I felt would allow me to, um, you know, uh, reflect on car culture in the United States um, and the car as an object in terms of maybe a system of cultural values and where the car stands at the issue of interculturality, mm -hmm. of issues of interculturality and ethnicity. And I was also really motivated with the DEI committee to reach out to these various um, ethnic and cultural communities in the region, right, to see um, you know, work work on automobile culture really between between cultures, so to speak. So yeah. Well, and and so that led us to uh, connecting. And you mentioned the uh, DEI. I'll just preface by saying you uh, came on board with the kind of an overall focus. And Motor Cities has a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, program called Many Voices, One Story. It's a whole different conversation 
Uh, but of course, making tracks sort of fits underneath that. Uh, but we focus on trying to tell the entire story, as Dr. Carter said, of so many different people who've contributed to the automobile industry. Uh, making tracks is just one of those endeavors. So we encourage you to, to kind of take a side trip and look at many voices, one story as we profile so many different uh, other diverse backgrounds in the, in the heritage area. So that brought uh, Dr. Louis Celine uh, Filion to us and, and started working on this project. And I wanted you to share uh, your perspective as you are working on a fellowship, you know, how valuable it was for you to be able to collect these interviews as well. You were our main interviewer, uh, as I encourage people to take a look at the uh, most recent posted interviews. You are our main interviewer for our most recent interviews, which happened to be uh, two gentlemen who were connected uh, to a country of Haiti. So maybe can you talk about how important it was for you to be part of that process and, and what you hope people will get out of that? Yeah, I was definitely delighted. So I'm a native speaker of French. I'm a Canadian native speaker of French from Montreal. So I reached out to various kind of French language communities um, in the region. That was uh, my, my role uh, in the DEI committee. Um, and this started, I would say, you know, the more serious work on this started last May in May 2021, mm -hmm. where uh, I reached out to various organizations and including uh, the Asian Network Group of Detroit. Uh, that I found through their website. And I was very, um, very lucky actually, because uh, within a few days, I reached out to them within a few days, I had a Zoom interview with three members of their board, the president, Margaret Corkery, uh, the treasurer and the secretary. And they were all very kind of, um, you know, motivated to, to work on this as well. Um, and she, Margaret Corkery was especially helpful in kind of providing a series a name series of, of, of um, contacts and potential interviewees to reach out to, uh, including one that we that was one of the founding members of the Asian Network Group of Detroit, Bessel Dubreuil, whose interview was posted yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so I was, um, you know, it was my first time organizing such oral histories. We discuss all together how to, you know, prepare obviously relevant and open-ended questions. Um, but I would say that um, what for me, we, you know, we reflected both of them, both of the gentlemen that we ended up inter interviewing are engineers, right? One is an electric, was an electric engineer at Chrysler. The other one was a design engineer at GM. Um, they both grew up in 80. What was highly interesting, I find, is the section that we uh, that I had entitled kind of cultural considerations, intercultural, interethnic reflections on their uh, on their path, uh, where we asked them questions such as, uh, you know, um, describe interethnic relations within your company and mm -hmm. within the other world, but also uh, where we asked them, um, which I think which was super interesting because they responded in totally op opposite ways, right? We asked them about um, their involvement in uh, diaspora groups. Um, so networks, community, African-American community groups within their profession, uh, within their company and within the larger community. And that's where we had totally different experiences. One of them uh, explicitly saying in, in, the, in the interview, that his experience, his youth under the dictatorship of Duvalier in 80 had made him highly suspicious of Shash groups. And the other one, um, what he totally recognized, he you know, re recognized the value of such um, mentorships programs, but he explicitly said, I never got involved because of that. And the other one was, was involved um, in the African uh, Ancestry Network at GM and various at his church as, as well, the Seventh Day Adventist Church in Farmington, et cetera. And it seemed that for him, the other one, this kind of involvement in groups was also um, at the very core of his integration in the US and at the very core of his integration in his kind of profession too, right? Right. So um, I thought this was highly interesting, the way they were able to, you know, we could see, because they both discussed at length as well, their youth um, and their early early days, but how, you know, kind of a similar youth as well. Right, very, I mean, very <laughs> similar path. No, and I'm glad right. you touched on that, the, um, yeah. the um, recognition of sort of the need for support. I, I think when you pull the lens back even further, talking to a group, and I think uh, Bizel said it nicely, that he is, though African American, you know, visually everyone would look at him in a group. He says he still considers himself that. But on top of that, he is foreign. He's got to learn the language and speak, you know, and, and integrate himself into that. So he has sort of faced these other sets of challenges, which you don't even think about 
uh, for someone to have to overcome. So they had, both had great inspirational stories. Plus, it gave you a chance to speak a, a little native tongue, you know, a little native language with them, and it was it was fun yeah. to share as well. So, no, yeah. that you know, I was glad to we were able to make those connections. And again, I encourage everyone to uh, to take a listen to them. But talking about those affinity groups, uh, that's something we've discovered in a lot of these conversations is that there needs to be sort of this safe place. Rudy in his interview said, you know, Chrysler or, you know, he continued to return to his Chrysler, but currently Stellantis um, offers something that he called um, um, uh, critical conversation. So opportunity for you to speak openly about, you know, anything that's concerning you within the company without reprisal. And I think we're in a very historic time where maybe people feel safer than ever to do that because of, of so many different things that have happened over the last couple of years to, that really, help to empower the, the, you know, the black community in particular in corporate America, but having the chance to do that. But I also would reflect on that same topic. Um, one of our interviews we conducted with Ed Walburn, who was a recently retired, but longtime vice president of General Motors, um, General Motors Design. He shared you know, some of the hardships he faced when he was told point blank, you will never rise to a level of, of executive at, at General Motors and you, you probably should look for another, another company. And he stuck it out you know, and he fought through it and, and built these sorts of networks that you're describing so that there was a place for others to uh, join and support him. And Dr. Carter, I know you have to go, so we appreciate you, you joining us. Uh, we are gonna continue and soldier on in your absence, but uh, you know, I wanted you to share your, your insights on all of this, but uh, you're muted there. I enjoyed it. I look forward to the next session. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Yeah, so we will, we will carry on uh, in our absence. But yeah, so it's interesting to hear uh, the, those who work within the companies, especially long time, talk about the evolution of that. You, you mentioned uh, Ruby as well, saying that now that that didn't exist when he started, but it exists now. And that's good to see that progression as companies recognize the need to sort of address uh, issues of, of social uh, edification so that we're not just working for, you know, for core to the bone, you know, step by step. I'll also say um, Louisa Lee did so much of the, uh, the work behind the scenes on the timeline research and, you know, discovered some very interesting things there. So again, I encourage everyone to take a look at the timeline and, you know, um, learn more about this, this history as is relative to uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, you know, as things progressed and changed. Such a difference in the early part of the, the, the century versus the sort of things that happened in the back half of the century. Um, so very important stuff. So we will come back to Louise Celine, but I want to talk to Rebecca Phoenix. Rebecca uh, joined us. Our fates were crossed in a in a in a very interesting way, in that we we've worked with the Wayne State uh, University Humanities Clinic, and they provided us some great uh, folks to work in some summer projects over the years. Uh, and an unfortunate circumstance came this past year, where our original um, humanities clinic fellow was unable to continue on with us. And they said, "Okay, well, we've got someone who we think can can uh, fill in nicely." and that's exactly what happened. And Rebecca uh, joined our team uh, mid-summer last year to research. But um, you know, she brought to the table this, this innate interest, I think, in this subject matter, uh, being native uh, to the area. And you know, really, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, brought along uh, a lot of sort of general interest in this subject. So Rebecca, you know, I wanted you to talk about what your experience was in doing some of the research, as well as your perspective on uh, maybe issues of, social justice that we ran into in the second half of this the century because that seemed to be very prevalent uh when you have these organizations formed like a uaw then their role becomes different in what role they play in social justice issues uh, as we move forward yeah um hi everybody so i came on uh through the humanities clinic like brian just said i um sometimes they'll set you up with two jobs i was originally my first job was a uh, cataloging gravestones. And so I was very excited to be placed with Motor City so I could do some um, research and like data analysis inside because it was very hot last summer. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was researching the back half of our timeline um, from kind of like the 1970s to today. And what I saw was a lot of social justice things like Brian said, um, and a lot of internal refigurings within um, companies so that they could be more in line with the unions so there were less union problems. Um, and uh, last summer was 2021. Um, the summer before that was Black Lives Matter summer, if everybody remembers. Um, and I actually went down to the, the March on Washington that Reverend Sharpton held. Um, 
that was a very interesting experience. Um, at one point we passed by the AFL-CIO uh, building and they had a Black Lives Matter banner up um, on like a couple, three sides of their building. Um, I had previously taken a class with Dr. Elizabeth Fow, who teaches at Wayne State. Um, she's a very, very good labor historian, if anybody's interested. Um, and we investigated the, you know, racial um, discriminations that labor unions were actively making to keep their base. So when I saw that banner in 2020, I was like, this is an interesting development. You know, I know there's, it's been 50, 60 years since some of the more famous cases of racial discrimination by labor unions has occurred, but that really cemented the shift that's happened in labor. Um, and UAW people spoke at the march. Um, there's been a lot of UAW people speaking on racial issues because that's important to their unionists and that, you know, important to everybody. Um, so it was, it was very nice as a Detroit girl, as a biracial girl, as uh, somebody who cares very deeply about the different types of people in my life to see those things um, and then to research them for the Motor Cities. Yeah, uh, and what I, what I found interesting as you see these patterns of this sort of, um, this sort of um, relation, it's in a relation between the unions and social justice. And like you said, it's, it's gone on this bumpy road. It's gone on this roller coaster of ups and downs and, and disconnecting and reconnecting. But all the way back to this, this topic I mentioned earlier, the 1932 Ford Hunger March, of which predated the, the formation of the UAW, but still sort of stood as a seminal moment. And as we approached the 90th anniversary, someone was examining, well, how were they interconnected back then? And, and how did they stay connected over the last you know, 90 years? Uh, but then you think about uh, in, in the timeline we just covered, we're covering now, in 1963, the, um, the march on Detroit, you know, they preceded the march in Washington. And we just did an article about this, the connection between UAW and, and leadership there. The connection between UAW and leadership um, there that brought Dr. King to Detroit, that, that, you know, that led the march. And then when you look at photos of, of course, the march in Washington and, and same thing where Walter Ruther and, and Randolph and others had gathered, there's always been this, this kind of tie between them. And I, I felt like it was sort of synonymous in the sense that um, by nature, unions are supposed to be sort of organizers to represent the people, to represent their stories. Uh, and it should be all stories. And so like you said, they had a lot to overcome to make sure that there was unification within that. But now it's just the idea is that there's brotherhood where, or in sisterhood, you know, where maybe it didn't exist at the very beginning. And so we, we kind of celebrate that story of it and, and to see it move forward. I'm really excited about the, the materials that you research for the next phase of it. This is sort of, we're in that middle uh, Empire Strikes Back phase of making tracks, but the return of, is coming it's, as far as the final leg of it and that the, the materials that Rebecca researched that kind of take us through the 80s uh, and the 90s. We'll, we'll talk about gas crisis. We'll talk about economic downturn. You know, we'll talk about, uh, you know, if, if we hadn't heard that we elected a Black president, we'll talk, talk about, um, you know, maybe the um, fact that a couple of car companies went bankrupt and had to be bailed out and what all of that means to, you know, the, the organization of the auto industry as it moves forward. But I think the representation of African-Americans in it, you know, very well represented uh, along the way. So I want to come back to uh, Louisa Lane before we open it up for questions and uh, kind of close with your thought of what you what you felt like you've seen and learned and as far as perspectives on the future, you shared how what some of the interviewees said and, and what you've learned yourself about, you know, where the thing, where the direction is going, because we serve a living industry and we'll continue to have to tell these stories. But, you know, we, I don't know, we heard stories about electric cars, we heard stories about, you know, modalities that are going to be changing. What did you gather from what you've heard so far? Well, I feel we have to obviously collect uh, a lot more <laughs> oral histories from people from a variety of backgrounds as well, right? We discussed um, as well kind of interviewing people who worked on the line, not just engineers, people who, uh, women too, right? So kind of people from a variety of backgrounds, but also um, I feel, and this was brought up by another board member, right? Uh, we discussed this a little bit uh, with Sabin Blake uh, as well, right? So I spoke a little bit about these, these networks, right? The, whether it is the, um, the African Ancestry Network at GM or all these networks within the companies. But myself, I noticed while I was kind of doing some preliminary interviews with, uh, with some of, unfortunately not all, not all of these led to actual interviews, but 
hopefully they, they will in the future. But I also spoke with a gentleman who was active. I won't mention his name because he didn't get interviewed in the end or he worked at one of the big trees and he was explaining to me how, uh, as bit as you said as well, talking about Rudy, how these uh, these networks, these African American ancestry networks, or you know, have evolved throughout the years. And I think it's also at his company, it was rather historically a recruitment tool uh, for uh, for black historically black colleges and universities, and became really a retention tool uh, to help people feel that they belong, etc. They organize. So I feel like we have to, it would be interesting to interview people who are even more involved than, for instance, uh, one of their interviewees was in these in these networks, right, who have leadership positions in these networks. I feel like that would be um, really interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, so. no, I think that's, you know, that's that's the direction we want to go in that it's an evolving story. It's a continuum of, of stories to be added here. And Dr. Carter shared that earlier. Uh, that we we this is sort of a launch to that, but we want to invite those with ideas, you know, those with opportunities that think, you know, their stories to be captured. We are only one camera away, I think, from sitting down and talking to some people and capturing their uh, their stories. So we look forward to that. You know, sadly, and this is our, our public forum to say this, and thank you, uh, Dr. Filion, uh, for the work that you've done over the last year. This might be the last time because your your fellowship is going to end here in a couple months, and uh, you know, be on the bigger and better things. But we appreciate all that you've added to the story over the last year or so and that this journey of discovery with you so I really enjoyed it so thank you oh, so thank much you. for no, i was i was delighted and i'll, I'll follow i'll keep you know I'll, I'll be following what's going on still we'll, we'll keep in touch huh? we'll sign our yearbooks and put our <laughs> phone numbers in and we'll all stay in yeah. touch i also want to give you a chance to, to plug um i mentioned the uh the e and i work and when you came on board you also joined up with another project the southwest detroit auto heritage guy so maybe you want to quickly mention what you're going to be working on with them for those who may have their ears perked up for uh, that upcoming work what the southwest detroit auto heritage guy you know will be up to in the next couple months as well um yeah so uh i mean we are in the process you the southwest detroit auto heritage guide is also on the featured and the, on the motor cities website right, right. so um I believe that we are still in the process of uploading new material. I will be uh, writing an essay about um, how um, the challenges we are, we had still would like to organize a workshop uh, in particular with the Latinx community uh, to kind of um, feature again um, uh, their stories uh, in the auto industry. Um, so, but in the moment, you know, funding, we still have to obtain more, more funding for this. Right. Um, but um, in the meantime, I will be working on an essay on the challenges of writing kind of neighborhoods, histories in the context of dislocations and mm -hmm. suburban renewal, et cetera, that should be hopefully posted um, on the website as well uh, in, next, uh, in next months, yeah. Yeah, I wanted you to just touch on that because it, it kind of shows that there's, again, this, this work that's gonna continue to flow forward and the Southwest sky still represents that, as Dr. Carter said, this melting pot. Southwest yeah. Detroit is is literally that, and it's this cultural and ethnic melting pot of, of religions and and you. Uh, you know those who came to that to that area. So we're looking forward to the content that's going to come up there. Uh, Rebecca I wanted to also post you sort of you know some some vision for the future. You are the person we're handing the baton to as as an emerging historian, as someone who is was following this path. But what encourages you about what you've been seeing with the making tracks research and you know for the future of collecting these sorts of stories? I'm very excited um, about the the communication with the public aspect and um, the capturing of everyday stories aspect. Uh, my research in my master's program is how to make home history more accessible um, and how to find better techniques for people to preserve their family legacy. And this includes, you know, their relationship with the area they live in, in this case, Detroit and the auto industry. Um, it's, it, this project serves as a really perfect example of how history doesn't have to be elite. Um, history is for the public always and history should reach out to be able to interact with its subjects on equal terms. So I'm very excited with everything that's happening. That's a great way to put it. History does not have to be elite. I was thinking of a way to sort of couch that. The idea is that 
you know, we don't want people to be intimidated by, well, I'm not this person. I didn't hold this big position, you know, but we want you to kind of tell your everyday story because we're all living it, uh, you know, every day and making new history every day. Uh, we did have a question and feel free to pose them if you, if you are still thinking of one. We did have a question, um, just, which is a tough one. This is understanding every piece of history cannot be added to making tracks. Uh, what moment, person, idea, date was cut that you would suggest viewers to look into? Um, you know, as I was explaining in the introduction, we tried to sort of take themes and high, you know, level uh, events that would have shaped the African American community or Southwest Detroit's, uh, you know, landscape. Um, but, you know, obviously, we're not going to be able to catch every every piece of it. There's a huge amount of American history and local history and African American history and then automotive history that all have to meld together into the Making Tracks site. So there will be a ton of things that will continue to be added. So I think we, we look forward to that in the way that there is no period at the end of this uh, sentence now. So I don't think there's anything that was cut that can't be added. There may be something that sticks out to me is that we don't, we don't have an entry on the earlier uprising in Detroit. We talk a lot about the 67 uprising, a lot of people know of that really had you know, monumental effects on the city of Detroit and the region around it. When I say Detroit, you know, it affects Flint and it affects Lansing, it affects everyone sort of in this, this region, but we're talking about Detroit. But we didn't talk about the 43 um, you know, uprising, the riots that happened then that sort of would have had a, a, a key effect, uh, especially around the time that we were in you know, World War II and we're racking things up there and the recovery that the nation would have been going through or beginning to go through. So I would say maybe that's one uh, element that hasn't been addressed, but it doesn't mean that it can't be addressed. So uh, you've given us an idea for something that could be worked in because it's not the, the first time it's come up. But maybe that's one that uh, we didn't get a chance to look into. But we also have a huge list of, of uh, potential uh, entries that, that could be addressed that we will continue to plug away at. So this may be the first, second, third, fourth time you'll hear from us again to talk about new content being added. It was very appropriate to have done it during uh, Black History Month. And the interviews were really exciting to post. And then the timeline content just helps to back that up and fortify it. You know, good, good vegetables to eat with your, with your meal so that you can kind of really get the content of what was going on there. Uh, so I think we are looking forward to to adding new uh, continuously. So check back often, and we'll also send little nudges and reminders out often uh, to let you all know. Uh, so if there are no more uh, questions, we are just um, kind of coming up on our time. Anywho, I'd like to thank those who have joined us. I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Filion and Rebecca, for for joining us. I appreciate all of your work again on the project. It's not the end; it really is the beginning of of um, you know sort of this emergence of, of new content here, especially with the new perspective of being able to do uh, more contemporary interviews and get real stories from real people in the second half of the century. So there are, there are plenty more to tell. Uh, we're excited for what we've done and, and excited for the future of it. Uh, speaking of the future, I do want to give a quick plug uh, for those who are following our Motor Cities at Home series uh, that next month, uh, this time, in fact, uh, on the 23rd of, of um, March, we will be back with a panel on women's history and women's impact in the automotive and particularly talking about women as role models. So, you know, so generational role models now that are in place for women in leadership and how that is impacting you know, new generations. So it's gonna be an exciting panel led by our own executive director, Sean Palmerville Size. We've got some great guests coming on board. So join us uh, here in a month on um, March 23rd at noon for our panel on women's history. So with that being said, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and we're gonna wrap it up. I will see you soon uh, for more content, Motor Cities at Home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.